one-of-a-kind water park which brings theme park guests and marine wildlife together within an all-inclusive tropical paradise with hidden caves, winding rivers and reef habitats to explore. But does it deliver on its promise of a luxurious, unforgettable experience or are there better ways to spend your time and money when you're next visiting Orlando? Hi, I'm the Frugal Brit, and for this video, I'll be providing an overview tour of the Discovery Cove water park, including my top tips. And in part two, I'll give a completely unbiased view of my most recent visit, covering the good and the not so good to help you decide whether it's worth a trip. So what is Discovery Cove exactly? Technically, it's a water park and part of SeaWorld Parks and Entertainment, which includes the nearby SeaWorld Orlando and Aquatica Parks, which I've previously done reviews on. Unlike your typical water park, Discovery Cove offers guests an all-inclusive experience with practically no queuing and allows guests to interact with a range of marine animals, including bottlenose dolphins, which the park is most famous for. The layout of the park is fairly straightforward for a theme park. I found it useful to split it into three main areas. Over to the east, you have the large windaway river section. In the middle, we have the Dolphin Lagoon for the park's signature dolphin swim experience. Then over to the west, you have the Grand Reef Habitat. When driving over to Discovery Cove, parking is free and you'll want to arrive around 7am to maximise your time inside the park. I will provide some extra transportation information in the description. You'll make your way over to the Polynesian themed lobby building with a giant dolphin sculpture hanging from its ceiling. They don't let anyone in before 7.15 so not really worth arriving much earlier than this. After checking in, you'll be given your return times for any upgraded experiences that you've purchased. You're then led through to the park, starting with a wide view of the Windaway River. You'll then head right into a beautifully lush, palm-lined, meandering path over streams and bridges under a thatched walkway that takes you to another picturesque view of the river. Team members will direct you over to the Laguna Grill for your complimentary breakfast buffet, which is served from 7 until 10.30. On the day of my visit, they were serving muffins, fresh fruit, assorted pastries, French toast, scrambled eggs, waffles, sausage links, bagels. You also have soft drinks, orange juice and coffee included. Once you've had your fill, you'll make your way over to one of the locker and wetsuit stations. There's three that you can choose from. The Grand Reef is the quietest, but also the least central, so we'll require slightly more walking. For my tour, we'll start with the Grand Reef, so we'll head over to the west of the park. You have the option of choosing either a full wetsuit or one of the vests. The full suit will obviously keep you warmer in the water, but those taking advantage of the free drinks may appreciate not having to get in and out of a wetsuit every time they have to head to the bathroom. In addition to your wetsuit, we'll grab a snorkel and a goggle kit and make our way over to the Grand Reef. In this tropical paradise, surrounded by scenic palms, rocky terrain and sandy beaches, guests can swim and snorkel with thousands of colourful tropical fish and velvety rays within an impressive coral reef habitat. You can take paths and bridges to the reef's islands and hidden grottos. And down below you can swim under bridges amongst the marine life and cascading waterfalls. You can also get up close to some reef sharks which are housed safely behind glass walls. So swimming with these sharks is one of a few upgraded experiences over in this part of the park. You also have the ray feeding, the flamingo mingle as well as the sea venture underwater walking tour inside a diving helmet. I am unfortunately yet to experience these upgrades. The Grand Reef contains a number of private cabanas to rent. These contain tables, chairs, lockers and towels, and apparently a private stash of snacks and refreshments which a host will periodically restock. There's also some extra cabana upgrades which I'll link to in the video description. For any refreshments near the Grand Reef, you have a small snack bar serving complimentary snacks and beverages and one of the park's popular slushy machines. Next, we'll take a walk through Discovery Cove's sandy beaches for the Dolphin Lagoon. As mentioned earlier, this is where guests come to see the park's bottlenose dolphins. For those that have paid for the Dolphin Swim upgrade, you'll be swimming in either the Sand Dollar, Seahorse or the Starfish Lagoons, which have their own cabanas that you'll need to check into before your appointed Dolphin Swim time for a quick safety brief. Worth mentioning no jewellery, phones or cameras allowed. Be warned, the dolphins like the water to be a lot colder than humans. We're not talking ice bath cold, but a lot colder than you'd like it to be. Because of this, you might want to opt for the full wetsuit instead of the vest. The experience once in the water lasts around 30 minutes in total. You'll be assigned an animal care specialist who will educate you on dolphin habits, behaviours and communication skills. Following this, each group member will get a chance to stroke, hug and swim with the dolphin and pose for both individual and group photos taken by one of the park's official photographers, followed by a few jumps and tricks. Near the Dolphin Lagoon, we also have another snack bar, which is the Polynesian-themed Hibiscus Hideaway, which serves snacks, alcoholic beverages, vanilla and pineapple soft-serve ice cream, and freshly made flatbread pizzas, all complimentary. 
It's around this time in the trip that the Laguna Grill reopens for lunch, which is between 11 and 3.30. There's a wider selection here compared to breakfast. You'll find salad bowls, wraps, ceviche, mojo pork, Caribbean coleslaw, seasoned vegetables, Jamaican pepper steak, rice, jerk chicken, coconut crusted salmon, different cakes and brownies, and fresh fruit. For any fussy eaters, you have mac and cheese, hot dogs, and chicken tenders. There's homemade chips or crisps as we call them in the UK, all of which can be enjoyed in shaded outdoor seating. Word of warning here, don't leave any food unattended. You'd be surprised at how quick the park's wildlife will pounce. After you've fueled up on the lunch buffet, we'll head over to my favourite part of the park, which is the Wind Away River section. We'll first head over the bridge towards Serenity Bay, a contender for most picturesque area of the park, containing a huge freshwater pool heated to 85 degrees, surrounded by white beaches and lounge chairs. This is the park's main pool with an eye-catching waterfall feature and roaming wildlife. If you're lucky, you may catch the flamingos on their way over to the Grand Reef. Next, we'll grab a flotation noodle, which is strongly recommended regardless of swimming ability, before heading for the Wind Away River, which you can access via an underwater cave with views of Serenity Bay and its waterfalls through gaps in the cave walls. As you exit the cave, you'll ride soothing currents through varied tropical landscapes inside dense rainforest and rocky terrain. Over on the southeastern section, there's a waterfall doorway that takes you into the explorer's aviary underneath a mesh ceiling to keep the birds contained. You can exit the river here to explore over 250 species of colourful birds of all shapes and sizes that soar around you in its beautiful gardens and learn about the conservation work that goes on behind the scenes. You're welcome to pick up a feeding pot for the bird feeding. Little tip, they're at their hungriest earlier in the day. I should mention that whilst the Windaway River waterfall is the most fun way to enter the aviary, any wildlife photographers will be pleased to hear that there is a dry entrance away from the river. Next, we'll head back into the Windaway River through another waterfall which takes you out the aviary Further up the river, you'll pass tiki sculptures, maybe passing some depressingly expensive sunglasses that I left behind, eventually coming to another exit for the freshwater oasis. This is a sort of mini lazy river at the centre of the larger Windaway River. At its centre is the Marmoset Island, which hosts a trainer talk and enrichment session usually every two hours, featuring the fluffy Marmoset monkeys. You also have enrichment sessions nearby for the Asian clawed otters that you can view from above and below the water. We'll return now to the Windaway River. Another warning here, the depth of the water is very inconsistent and can often lead to scraped feet and knees, something to be mindful of. Water shoes might be a good tip here. We'll continue on through the lush foliage, cascading waterfalls and crystal clear waters on the log bridges before completing the circuit and arriving back at Serenity Bay. If you've worked up a thirst during your lap of the river, there's the blue bamboo bar conveniently located nearby. So as with the other refreshment points, beer and wine is complimentary, but they do also offer a premium drinks package for $40, which includes signature cocktails, a fully stocked liquor bar, craft and domestic beers and upgraded wines. No pizzas here, but they do serve pretzels. Plenty of seating nearby, but guests can also enjoy a cold drink on underwater chairs in the relaxation pool, which is steps away from the bar and also connected to the freshwater oasis. In reviewing the park, I'm not sure I need to spend much time telling you how beautiful it is. Pretty clear from the first part of the video, they've clearly done an incredible job of creating a tropical lagoon paradise, which is immaculate and feels nice and secluded. When talking about Discovery Cove, people will often say how it's not like any other park experience around. So with no attraction queues, free food and drinks, it definitely stands out from the crowd in central Florida. It's a lot more relaxing compared to the others and almost feels like being on a cruise rather than at a theme park. That might not be for everyone though. Discovery Cove lets nature do all the heavy lifting without relying on things such as water slides to entertain. Thrill seekers may prefer the less relaxing Aquatica or Volcano Bay nearby. The atmosphere is completely different at Discovery Cove. Attendance is deliberately kept low with no one rushing around to get to the front of attraction queues. My fellow Brits need not worry about reserving any lounge chairs as they're not in short supply here. Getting free drinks contributes to the atmosphere and I found staff friendliness to be above par. Speaking of above par, if you feel this describes the video you're watching, always appreciate a like to help support the channel. The animal trainers are passionate and clearly take animal safety and well-being extremely seriously. They're keen to highlight that all animal participation is done on a voluntary basis using positive reinforcement. Given their captivity, I appreciate the ethics of this is complex, but the situation could definitely be worse. So as mentioned previously, the dolphin swim isn't part of every ticket package, but SeaWorld does encourage it, understandably. The whole experience is centered around it, really. 
here's the variable pricing for both options. The swim is a lot more expensive in peak months. If it's your first visit, I think you've got to pay the extra. You won't want to leave without being able to say you've swam with dolphins. SeaWorld offers packages to include 14-day admission to SeaWorld and Aquatica, which are definitely worth considering. Do bear in mind that SeaWorld offers incredible promotions for Discovery Cove around Black Friday and in January. I couldn't believe my luck when I got a dolphin swim ticket with 14-day admission to SeaWorld, Aquatica and Bush Gardens, all with free parking for £155 from attraction tickets in the UK. A ridiculously good deal when you factor in the free food and drink. With this in mind, for anyone already planning a visit to the other SeaWorld parks in addition to Discovery Cove, then the multi-park ticket provides superb value. Without those parks included though, I think the value drops considerably given that there's so much else to do in the area. Some of you may be interested to know that I am working on a Bush Gardens review, so make sure you're subscribed if you're considering a visit. With regard to the Dolphin Swim upgrade, I think it's worth managing expectations a little bit. It is delivered well, but you won't actually spend that much time on a personal level with the dolphins. It's not going to feel like a scene from the latest Avatar movie. If I recall correctly, it's three very brief encounters in total per guest, but your swim with the dolphin is only around 10 seconds in total. It is disappointing that you can't take your phones or cameras into the Dolphin Lagoon, but understand the rationale. So you won't come away with any photos of you with the Dolphin unless you pay for one of their super expensive photo packages. If you want digital copies for social media, etc., that'll cost you $224 per group minimum. That does seem a bit naughty, but maybe I'm just being an overly frugal Brit, but would love to hear your thoughts on this. I know some recommend that people stagger the times of the dolphin swim so that there's always someone to take pictures from the beach, but you're not really close enough for a good photo and the angles won't be great. But I do think they maybe deserve to be forgiven for this. As far as nickel and diming goes, they have resisted a lot of temptations. For example, the likes of parking, lockers, alcohol and snacks remain free. Yes, you'll need to pay $40 for the fancy drinks, but I don't think it's reasonable to expect these without paying extra and people do seem to appreciate having the option. As far as the food goes, well, it is free, and that's probably the best thing I can say about it, I'm afraid. I was satisfied, but it's not the best. SeaWorld describes it as gourmet food. Unless gourmet now means school cafeteria, I don't think that's at all accurate. The coffee was also barely drinkable. Again, anyone with experience, do let me know if you think I'm being a bit harsh here with the food. It is a shame I didn't get to try one of the pizzas at Hibiscus Hideaway, as they do look pretty good. But the quality of food hasn't stopped Discovery Cove from becoming the highest rated amusement park in Central Florida. Definitely a one of a kind experience in all areas except for the food. Provided you're not seeking a thrilling all day non-stop water park experience or looking for fine dining, then Discovery Cove is definitely worth a trip. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. What do you guys think? Is it worth a day out of your next Orlando visit? Love to hear what you guys think in the comments. Subscribe if you haven't already. I recommend these two videos next.